good evening everyone and welcome to today's class uh, as usual we're going to start in 5 minutes so that people can join in okay we can start our today's discussion 
so uh, just a quick recap of what we have studied in last class it was majorly related to action potential how it is generated and i gave you a little bit of uh, confidence that you guys can actually understand and learn this though it seems little bit uh, complex but if you know that however we study things like channels transporters we study them separately right but in reality they do not work separately all of it is dependent upon the precursor or the environment or the stimuli so if you have this basic uh, understanding of how channels work how uh, transporters work how pumps work you can easily understand that and and get the logic behind it also that why only sodium channels are open in first or why they are closed why there is a concept of leaky channels and why we need pumps there to be in the first place right so all of it we have discussed in the last class so to switch some gears uh, see in the coming week and this week we gonna cover most of the small topics which uh, i avoided discussing earlier because i wanted to have you guys an overall view of the membrane and the proteins right so membranes have lipids and proteins so we studied about different types of lipid we studied about uh, different types of proteins and all right but on one hand we have briefly touched upon the structure of lipids but we have not till now discussed anything about the protein structures right we know about amino acids we know what are proteins but we have not actually touched upon the topics of what exactly happens once the covalent bond is formed between two amino acids and it becomes a peptide and then polypeptide and all so what exactly happens after that right and uh, and the very basic question like why it happens at all correct so we'll try to answer these questions in the coming days so we'll start our a very brief discussion about protein structures okay so protein structures as you know that protein is made up of amino acids a polymer of amino acids so if we see that a description of all covalent bonds mainly peptide bonds and disulfide bonds linking amino acid residue in a polypeptide chain is its primary structure so what is primary structure primary structure is nothing is just a linear sequence of amino acids and how they are connected to each other via peptide bonds right the most important element of primary structure is the sequence of amino acid residues secondary structure refers to particularly stable arrangements of amino acid residue giving rise to recurring structural patterns right so primary structure is just a sequence of amino acid in which they are attached secondary structure is particular 3d a particular arrangement of amino acids giving rise to a particular structural or some structural pattern they are not only linear amino acids anymore right it will be called as secondary structure then tertiary structure that is it describes all aspects of the three dimensional folding of a polypeptide right we have seen the structure of many proteins right when we were discussing about gpcrs when we saw a uh, glycophorin structure all these so you see that they have some structure so that structure which is which you saw till now is the tertiary structure right it is the functional form of the protein which is which basically is made up of multiple secondary structures right so when a protein has two or more polypeptide subunits their arrangement in space is referred to as quaternary structure so to give you a little bit of brief so a primary structure as i told is just a linear sequence of amino acids okay a secondary structure will be some arrangement of these amino acids with respect to each other in the space here i have given the example of in the the diagram you can see a secondary structure named as alpha helix is depicted okay then a tertiary structure will be multiple secondary structures coming together in a polypeptide chain it will lead to a specific 3d structure of 3d structure made from these linear sequence of amino acid it is called tertiary structure when multiple such tertiary structures come together to make a functional protein it is called as quaternary structure okay so it is quite basic till now but still to have a little bit of more cleared explanation of uh, things i'm gonna share a very quick 
video with you guys as usual give me one minute So why is it so important to learn about protein structure? Well, let's take the example of Alzheimer's disease, which affects the brain. So in certain people as they age, proteins in their neurons start to become misfolded and then form aggregates outside of the neurons, and this is called amyloid. So amyloid is really just clumps of misfolded proteins that look a bit like this. And as you can see, as this amyloid builds up, it starts to interfere with the neuron's ability to send messages, and this leads to dementia and memory loss. So if we can understand how these proteins become misfolded in the first place, then we might be able to find a cure for this debilitating disease. And to understand how proteins become misfolded, we must first understand how they become properly folded. So before we begin, I just want to do a quick review of terms. You can have one amino acid, so I'll just write AA for amino acid, and then you can have two amino acids that are linked together by a peptide bond. So this is a peptide bond. And as you add more and more amino acids to this chain of amino acids, you start to get what is called a polypeptide or many peptide bonds. And each amino acid within this polypeptide is then termed a residue. And then proteins consist of one or more polypeptides. And so I will use the terms polypeptide and protein interchangeably. So at the most basic level, you have primary structure. And primary structure just describes the linear sequence of amino acids. And it is determined by the peptide bond linking each amino acid. So if I were to take my amyloid example from Alzheimer's disease, and I stretch out that protein all the way, then this linear sequence is just the primary structure. So then moving on, we have secondary structure. And secondary structure just refers to the way that the linear sequence of amino acids folds upon itself. This is determined by backbone interactions. And this is determined primarily by hydrogen bonds. There are two motifs that, or patterns that you should be familiar with, the first of which is called an alpha helix. And if you were to take this polypeptide and wrap it around itself into a coiled-like structure, just like so, then you would have the alpha helix. And the hydrogen bonds just run up and down, stabilizing this coiled structure. And another motif or pattern that you can be familiar with is with a beta sheet. And that just looks like this. It kind of looks more like a zigzag pattern. And the beta sheet is stabilized by hydrogen bonds, just like so. And if you have the amino ends and the carboxyl ends line up, like so, then this sheet is called a parallel beta sheet. And then conversely, if you have a single polypeptide that is then wrapping up upon itself just like this and you have the hydrogen bond stabilizing like so then you have the amino end coming around and lining up with the carboxyl end and you have a anti-parallel configuration. There is a third level of protein structure called tertiary structure, and tertiary structure just refers to a higher order of folding within a polypeptide chain. And so you can kind of think of it as the many different folds within a polypeptide, which then fold upon each other again. 
And so this depends on distant group interactions, so distant interactions. And just like secondary structure, it is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. But you also have some other interactions that come into play, such as van der Waals interactions. You also have hydrophobic packing. And also disulfide bridge formation. So if we explore hydrophobic packing, just a little bit more over here, say we have a folded up polypeptide or protein. And this protein is found within the watery polar environment of the interior of a cell. So if we have water on the exterior of this protein, then we will find all of the polar groups on the exterior interacting with this water. And then on the interior, you would find the nonpolar or hydrophobic groups hiding from the water. Disulfide bridges, on the other hand, describe an interaction that happens only between cysteines. So cysteines are a type of amino acid that have a special thiol group as part of its side chain. And this thiol group has a sulfur atom that can become oxidized. And when this oxidation occurs, you get the formation of a covalent bond between the sulfur groups. The formation of a disulfide bridge happens on the exterior of a cell. And you tend to see the formation of separated thiol groups on the interior of a cell. And that is because the interior of the cell has antioxidants, which generate a reducing environment. And since the exterior of a cell lacks these antioxidants, you get an oxidizing environment. So if I were to ask you which environment favors the formation of disulfide bridges, you would say the extracellular space does. Then there is one final level of protein structure, and that is called quaternary structure. And quaternary structure describes the bonding between multiple polypeptides. Multiple polypeptides. The same interactions that determine tertiary structure play a role in quaternary structure. And so let's say I have one folded up polypeptide, two folded up polypeptides, and a third and a fourth. The quaternary structure is described by the interactions between these four polypeptides. And within the completed protein structure, each individual polypeptide is termed a subunit. Since this protein has four subunits, it is called a tetramer. And so if I were to have two subunits, it would be called a dimer, three would be called a trimer, and then anything above four is called a multimer. So the term for a completely properly folded up protein is called the proper conformation of a protein. And to achieve the proper conformation, you must have the correct primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. And if any of these levels of protein structure were to break down, then you start to have misfolding, which can then contribute to any of a number of disease states. Right. So it was a very uh, generic video about the basics of uh, protein structures. So let me get back to the slides. Why can't I find them? I hope you guys can see it. Yeah. So as I mentioned, a primary structure is just the representation of how the amino acids are connected uh,
why are the peptide bonds and sequentially how they are connected the primary structure is the one which actually dictates the upcoming structures the secondary structure the tertiary structure and all okay that is why it is important to know the sequence of a protein so what do i mean by sequence of a protein that you know after which amino acid which amino acid comes because it is being translated by the gene okay hence that is why if you know the structure it becomes quite easy to, to have a, a slight guess about what that protein might be uh doing or might be involved in or what kind of a protein it will be okay so the function of a protein depends upon its amino acid sequence the bacterium escherichia coli produces around more than 3000 different proteins a human has 20000 genes that may produce over a million different proteins and yet all these proteins have different sequence and a uh, limited secondary and tertiary structures and they perform different functions okay so amino acid sequences are important elements of the broader realm of biological information they are a major functional expression of information stored in dna in the form of genes the sequences are not at all random each protein has a distinctive number of sequences of amino acid residues right so why we are saying proteins are important because in the end when we are saying dna is being replicated it is transferred from one generation to another generation so what exactly it is making that is ultimately doing the function it is the protein right so it is kind of a uh, workhorse for dna the dna stores the information and proteins are the one which are doing the functions which are stored in our dna okay some simple observations illustrate the functional importance of primary structure or the amino acid sequence of a protein as i mentioned if you know the primary structure or primary structure or which is just uh, the sequential arrangement of amino acids for that particular protein it serves as a functional understanding of the protein structure and functional relation first as we have already noted proteins with different functions always have different amino acid sequences okay second thousands of human genetic diseases have been traced to the production of proteins with less activity or altered activity the alteration can arise from a single change in the amino acid sequence such as sickle cell anemia you guys might have aware of that in sickle cell anemia there is change of one amino acid which leads to this particular disease and or to the deletion of a larger portion of the polypeptide chain such as uh, duchenne muscular dystrophy in this a part of chromosome is deleted leading to the deletion of the polypeptide chain and hence this disease is prevalent finally on comparing functionality uh, sorry uh, finally on comparing functionally similar proteins from different species we find that these proteins often have similar amino acid sequences right so we need to understand this point for example if we are saying there are two different species and they both perform say similar function if we take the example of glycolysis so you guys are aware that glycolysis is one of the basic biochemical reaction which is kind of conserved right because even in prokaryotes when we do not have a uh, extensive ets cycle and all that the basic uh, operation through which they produce energy is the glycolysis and glycolysis has different steps these different steps use different enzymes and enzymes at the end of the day are mostly proteins right hence can we speculate that the glycolysis pathway the enzymes associated in the glycolysis pathway or in simpler words the proteins which are involved in glycolysis pathway are doing the same function they are doing glycolysis so can we say that among different species the proteins which are doing glycolysis in a species will be similar to the uh, proteins which are performing glycolysis in species b right so that is true there is high level of conservation when we talk about similar function in different species with respect to protein okay then we have 
the amino acid sequence for a particular protein is not absolutely fixed or invariant virtually all of the proteins in humans are polymorphic having amino acid sequence variants in different human population so what do we mean by this so this comes from core genetics uh, specifically mendelian genetics so in mendelian genetics we know that if we have a progeny so if, if we talk about ourselves we are the product of genes from our parents right one copy from our mother and another copy from our father but our mother and father are not identical twins obviously right so they have different set of same chromosomes and we have same same or single single copy from both of them yet we are of same species we are also doing glycolysis we are also breathing we are also doing all of the biochemical processes which our parents are doing right which means the proteins will be same in our parents as well as in us but if we talk about the sequence chances are the protein sequence in our parents is somewhat similar or say mostly similar to the protein sequence in us because there will be little bit of variation present in us hence we are not exactly like our parents correct so there is little bit of in variation or uh, variation is involved in the protein sequences within the same population also and such uh, proteins are called polymorphic proteins poly means many morphic means uh, stages or structure of a right although the amino acid sequence in some regions of the primary structure might vary considerably without affecting biological functions most protein contain crucial regions that are essential to their function and thus have sequences that are conserved so right now i have just convinced you guys that if we have different if we are different individual though having same protein but the sequence will be different now i am saying the vice versa of it that if the function is highly conserved just like like all is as i mentioned then the sequences or the primary sequence of a protein will be highly conserved because that sequence derives the secondary structure and the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure of that protein and that quaternary structure is the one which is finally doing the function so if we change the primary sequence it will ultimately change the final structure or the tertiary structure leading to the change in the function of that protein correct i hope it makes sense then the fraction of the overall sequence that is a uh, critical varies from protein to protein complicating the task of relating sequence to three dimensional structure and structure to function before we can consider this problem further however we must examine how sequence information is obtained so this will be job of our next class that we are talking about how uh, the primary structure derives the functional structure of a protein but on the first hand we don't know how to achieve the primary sequence in the first place right so we'll discuss that part in the next class but before that i want you guys to have a little bit of taste of a secondary structure which is predominantly present in membrane proteins specifically in membrane proteins so that it will give you a heads up with respect to the uh yeah it will give you the heads up with respect to the coming classes or the secondary structure just wait let me share the screen talk about alpha helix structure which is a common secondary structure of protein if we talk about protein structure then it can be classified into four different levels the primary structure secondary structure tertiary and the quaternary structure but this video would focus on the secondary structures out of the secondary structures we have alpha helices beta turns and beta pleated sheet 
But today's focus would be totally on alpha helix, its structure, its function, where we find them and how we can study the structure of alpha helix and the factors that stabilize it. So this video is all about that. So if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned till the end of this video. First of all, let's try to understand where do we find alpha helix structures? It can be found in many proteins such as proteins that are receptors and very common example is G protein couple receptor. It has seven transmembrane domain and each transmembrane domain is alpha helix spanning a 10 to 12 amino acid residues. Many transcription factors such as leucine which contains leucine zipper motif that is also an example of alpha helix. So many transcription factor, receptor, ion channels and many other molecules might have alpha helix conformation. Now let us try to understand how we can study and gain the information about alpha helix. First we have to start with extra crystallography which begins with crystallization of the protein. Then there is extra crystallographic method where we obtain a diffraction pattern while we pass X-ray sample through this crystal. From this diffraction pattern, we can convert it into frequency domain to get the electron density map. After Fourier transformation, we get this electron density map. Once we get the electron density map, it's like the overall outline of a puzzle. And we have to fit our molecule of interest and start building model of it. And ultimately that model might give rise to the protein structure or structure of any molecule. So this is the overall workflow of X-ray crystallography by which we can understand the protein structure. If you want to know more about X-ray crystallography, click the link in the I button. So the biggest feature of alpha helix is that helix and it was found by Pauling and colleagues around 1940s. So alpha helical structure has amino acid in specific orientation. And obviously you can understand the orientation is a helix fashion where four amino, almost four amino acids are there per turn. 3.6 to be precise. So alpha helix has 3.6 residues per turn of the helix. All of these residues that are present in the alpha helix are bonded or interacting with each other via al via hydrogen bonding and this hydrogen bonding does not take place in a haphazard manner and there are certain rules that are governing which residues would form hydrogen bonding before coming to that rule we should understand that from a scattered structure of a protein that means the primary structure making a geometrical uh, structure like helix is a long process. It requires a lot of planning and organization to make such of geometrically organized structure. So there must be some rule which is governing this interaction which helps to stabilize these kind of helical structures. Let us understand this rule. There is a rule in hydrogen bonding which is ensuring this helical structure is stabilized. Let's imagine a particular amino acid from the n turbidus and we name it I. Then the next one would be I plus 1. After that, there would be I plus 2, I plus 3, and I plus 4. It turns out the hydrogen bond would be formed between I and I plus 4 amino acid. So the carboxyl group of I and the NH group of the I plus 4 amino acid would form hydrogen bond with each other. Irrespective, irrespective of the position, this kind of rule is valid throughout the helix. Now let us talk about few special cases when helix is forming. Specific residues such as glutamate are good for helix formation. But if glutamate residues are there in reputation, then it might be bad because glutamate residues at pH 7 has negative charges and these negative charges could cause strong electrostatic repulsion and thereby destabilizing the helix. The same goes for the basic amino acids, which are lysine or arginine. They are positively charged in pH 7. That is why they can also undergo electrostatic repulsion if they are very close to each other. 
but if they are dispersed throughout the structure it might not be a problem it would be actually favorable in terms of helix formation other amino acids such as proline is also termed as helix breaker because once proline is present in a uh, secondary structure it would create a tilt in the secondary structure as you can see here and the amide hydrogen of proline cannot be contributed cannot be used to make hydrogen bonds and proline side chain interferes sterically with the backbone and that is why it leads to a tilt of 30 degree corresponding to the helix axis so obviously we can understand if we have a proline residue in the secondary structure it would be ultra destable it would be destabilizing the helix so that is why prolines are proline is known as helix breaker i i took more than 300 interviews when i worked for facebook 80 residues in an alpha helix typically adopt specific dihedral angles and these dihedral angles are really important to define a particular structural characteristics and the map of dihedral angle is basically the ramachandran plot in this ramachandran plot these helix falls around minus 60 to minus 45 pi and psi angles so helix would be corresponding to this particular region and there are different regions for other particular uh, secondary structures such as beta pleated sheet or right handed or left handed helix now coming to the helix sense helix could be right handed or left handed right handed helix are the most common ones found in biological system it's very easy to understand right handed helix try to point your uh, thumb towards the helix axis and the your curl and your curl fingers direction would tell you the sense of the helix now alpha helix which is left uh, which has a left helicis helicity or a right helicity would be found in different locations in a ramachandran plot as depicted here also there are helix propensities that means the probability of an amino acid to be found in a particular helix this governs many factor i mean that means which of these amino acids might be incorporated to form a helix structure amino acids like alanine leucine methionine are helix makers that means if these amino acids are present in a protein sequence they would readily form alpha helical structures whereas other amino acids such as glycine and proline are known as helix breakers they break the helix but they are very good in terms of beta turn that is why helix propensity index tells us by a particular score that what is the probability that one particular amino acid would form a helix okay uh, i know this is too much for this uh, first introductory class of secondary structures but what i wanted you guys to understand that when we say right now we are talking about primary structure primary structure are the sequence representation or how amino acids are connected by a polypeptide bond right and this lead to the formation of secondary structure one type of secondary structure which you guys just saw was alpha helix so what do we mean by saying that we know the structure of a protein or it's a secondary structure so it means that we know the 3d coordinates of each and every atom of amino acid residue in a protein which is making that macromolecular structure that is alpha helix which you just saw so what are the number of amino acids per turn what is the angle between first amino acid and the third amino acid or fourth amino acid why it is called alpha helix are there any other type of helices or what are other secondary structures and all this information so overall knowing the structure of a protein means that we know the position of every atom or every amino acid residue with respect to the 3d plane right so that we can pinpoint where that particular atom is <coughs> right so that is where this particular video was little bit more complex because i haven't introduced this concept till now but this video was here just to let you know that what do we mean by structure and alpha helix because it is present in more in uh, membrane proteins uh, we can also ask similar thing that 
why alpha helices are present in membrane and why not other secondary structures so all these questions we will answer in the coming class okay so feel free to ask your questions and i'm keeping these lectures short because i've seen that people get i don't know maybe bored or something uh, so that i'm restricting the amount of information i'm conveying in a class in in one single class so that we can dig into multiple topics throughout this course okay so thank you so much for your attention and i'll see you guys in the next class